Delving into Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we continue our exploration of Paul's profound letter to the Colossians, a church grappling with challenges that resonate even today. Following the rich teachings of Colossians 1, where Paul establishes the preeminence of Christ and the transformative power of the gospel, these verses further deepen our understanding of the Christian walk. They are not mere words of encouragement, but a fervent call to a deeper, more genuine faith. Paul, with the heart of a shepherd, emphasizes the importance of unity, spiritual wisdom, and the knowledge of Christ. This passage is urging believers to look beyond superficial faith and embrace a life deeply rooted in Christ. In a world where truth is often obscured and genuine faith challenged, these verses stand as a beacon, guiding us to a steadfast and enriching relationship with our Savior. They remind us that our faith journey is both personal and communal, anchored in the unchanging truths of Christ's supremacy and the transformative power of His love. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1 states, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. This verse, penned by the Apostle Paul, carries a profound depth of pastoral care and spiritual fervor. Paul, though physically distant from the believers in Colossae and Laodicea, is deeply connected to them in the spirit. His use of the term great conflict reflects not a battle of arms, but a struggle in prayer and spiritual concern for their well-being. Paul's words reveal his dedication to the spiritual health and growth of these believers, emphasizing that true Christian ministry transcends physical presence. It's a reminder that in the body of Christ, we are interconnected, bearing each other's burdens and encouraging growth in faith, even from afar. Moreover, Paul's mention of those who have not seen him in the flesh extends his pastoral care beyond personal acquaintances. It teaches us that our commitment to fellow believers isn't limited to our local church or personal connections. As followers of Christ, we are called to have a heart for all of God's people, praying for and supporting them, regardless of whether we have met them personally. In this verse, we are thus encouraged to emulate Paul's example. We are reminded to have a deep, prayerful concern for our fellow believers near and far. Our faith journey is not just a personal venture, it's a collective pilgrimage where each of us plays a vital role in nurturing and supporting the spiritual growth of others in the faith family. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1 is not just an expression of Paul's personal feelings, it is a powerful exhortation for all believers. It calls us to a life of committed prayer, spiritual struggle, and unwavering support for our brothers and sisters in Christ, mirroring the selfless love and dedication that is at the heart of our Christian faith. Continuing from Paul's heartfelt expression in verse 1, we find the purpose of his great conflict articulated in the following verse. Verse 2 reads, That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. In this passage, Paul transitions from expressing his deep concern for the believers to revealing his ultimate goal for them. He desires their hearts to be encouraged and united in love. This knitting together in love is more than mere fellowship. It is a spiritual unity that binds believers together, reflecting the very nature of the body of Christ. The phrase, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, signifies a deepening of their faith and comprehension of God's truths. Paul longs for them to be fully assured in their understanding, not swayed by false teachings or superficial beliefs. This assurance comes from a profound and growing knowledge of God's mystery, which is revealed in the Father and Christ. This knowledge of the mystery is not a secret to be kept, but a truth to be deeply understood and cherished. It is the understanding of God's incredible plan of redemption through Jesus Christ, a plan that brings salvation and reconciliation to all who believe. Paul emphasizes that this knowledge is not just intellectual, but deeply transformative, impacting the heart and life of each believer. In essence, Paul is stressing the importance of spiritual maturity. He yearns for the believers to grow in love, unity, and understanding, being firmly rooted in the truth of the gospel. This growth is not an individual endeavor, but a collective journey, where each believer supports and strengthens the other in faith. Verse 2 is a powerful call to spiritual growth and unity. It beckons us to delve deeper into the riches of God's truth, to embrace the full assurance of our faith, and to live out that faith in a community of love. 
It's a reminder that our faith is both personal and communal, grounded in the profound truths of God and expressed in a life of love and mutual support among believers. Building upon the profound message in verse 2 about the unity and understanding in Christ, we come to verse 3, which declares, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This verse is a cornerstone in understanding the fullness of what Paul is communicating. The phrase, in whom, refers unmistakably to Christ. Here, Paul is emphasizing that in Christ alone are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is not just a statement about the superiority of Christ's teachings. It is a declaration of the complete sufficiency of Christ in all matters of wisdom and understanding. This verse challenges us to shift our focus from worldly sources of wisdom to the person of Jesus Christ. In a world overflowing with information and varying philosophies, Paul redirects our attention to the one true source of wisdom. The treasures he speaks of are not mere facts or data, but profound insights into the nature of God, the human condition, and the path to salvation. Understanding that all wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ has practical implications for our daily lives. It means that our quest for truth, understanding, and direction should always lead us back to Him. Whether we face moral dilemmas, seek purpose, or need guidance, the answer lies in deepening our relationship with Christ and immersing ourselves in His Word. Furthermore, this verse serves as a reassurance. In a world where uncertainty and confusion are rampant, knowing that Christ holds all wisdom and knowledge gives us a firm foundation. It assures us that no matter the complexity of the challenges we face, the answers are found in Him. Verse 3 is not just a theological statement, but a call to action. It invites us to actively seek Christ in our quest for understanding and to trust Him as the ultimate source of all wisdom. In doing so, we find not only the answers to our questions, but also the peace and assurance that come from knowing Christ is sovereign over all aspects of life and knowledge. Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 presents a compelling message, deeply rooted in the truth of Christ's supremacy and sufficiency. Through these verses, Paul communicates a heartfelt desire for believers to be united in love, grounded in understanding, and anchored in the wisdom found only in Christ. This passage serves as a powerful reminder that our spiritual journey is not solitary, but communal, where we are called to support and uplift each other in love and truth. It also reinforces the critical importance of seeking wisdom and understanding through our relationship with Christ, as He is the ultimate source of all knowledge and wisdom. These verses, therefore, are not just an encouragement, but a call to deepen our faith, to grow in our understanding of God's mysteries, and to live out these truths in a community of believers, unified and strengthened by the love of Christ. This message resonates with profound relevance, guiding us to live a life that is deeply connected to Christ and richly interwoven with the lives of our fellow believers. In the journey through Colossians, where Paul passionately imparts wisdom and guidance to the church, we reach a pivotal moment in Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. These verses stand as a beacon, illuminating the path for believers amidst a world rife with misleading doctrines and superficial truths. Following the profound insights of Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, where Paul emphasizes the richness of understanding and knowledge hidden in Christ, we are now confronted with a stark yet empowering reality. This passage is not merely a continuation of thought. It is a call to vigilance and unity. It challenges us to discern truth amidst falsehood, urging us to anchor our faith in the bedrock of Scripture. Simultaneously, it offers the comforting reminder that our spiritual journey is not a solitary endeavor. Our faith, though personal, is nurtured and strengthened within the collective body of Christ. In these verses, Paul masterfully intertwines the urgency of guarding against deception with the encouragement found in our shared faith, crafting a message that resonates deeply with every believer seeking to navigate their faith with wisdom and conviction in a complex world. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 4, we read, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. This verse holds profound significance for every believer, guiding us to remain vigilant and steadfast in our faith. 
The Apostle Paul, with his deep concern for the spiritual welfare of the Colossians, highlights a crucial warning, the threat of deception through eloquent yet misleading teachings. At the heart of this verse is a call to discernment. It urges us to be aware that not all teachings and doctrines, no matter how convincingly presented, align with the truth of the gospel. In an age where information is abundant and varied perspectives are offered, this verse is a beacon, reminding us to anchor our beliefs in the solid foundation of Scripture. The phrase, lest anyone should deceive you, warns us that there are those who might use their charm and persuasive speech to lead us away from the truth. This deception isn't always obvious. It can be subtle, wrapped in attractive rhetoric or intellectual appeal. Thus, the verse isn't merely a warning against obvious falsehoods, but also against the more insidious forms of error that can creep into our understanding. Moreover, Paul's admonition is an encouragement to deepen our understanding of God's Word. The best defense against deception is a robust and active engagement with the Bible. By immersing ourselves in Scripture, we equip ourselves with the knowledge and wisdom to discern truth from error. This deep dive into biblical teachings fortifies our faith, enabling us to stand firm against any misleading doctrine, however persuasive it may be. Colossians chapter 2 verse 4 is a timeless exhortation for believers to remain alert and grounded in the truth. It calls us to cultivate a discerning spirit, one that tests and weighs teachings against the unwavering standard of the scriptures. In doing so, we uphold the purity and integrity of our faith ensuring that we are not swayed by the shifting winds of doctrine, but are anchored firmly in the truth of God's Word. Building on the profound warning in verse 4 against deception, we find a message of assurance and encouragement in the subsequent verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, which states, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. This verse seamlessly connects with the previous one, providing both comfort and affirmation to believers. Paul, though physically distant from the Colossian believers, expresses his closeness in spirit. This spiritual presence underscores a vital truth. The unity and bond within the body of Christ are not confined to physical proximity. Believers are connected through the Holy Spirit, transcending geographical limitations. This connection is a source of strength and encouragement, especially when facing challenges or deceptions in our faith journey. The Apostle's joy in seeing your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ is a testament to the effectiveness of their faithfulness. Good order refers to the disciplined, orderly manner in which they conduct their lives and church affairs. It implies a community living in harmony, guided by the principles and teachings of Christ. This order is not a rigid, legalistic structure but a harmonious and loving alignment with God's will. Steadfastness of faith is equally crucial. It's the unshakable commitment to Christ and His teachings, standing firm against various challenges, including false teachings. This steadfastness isn't a static condition, but an active, enduring trust in Christ, constantly nourished and strengthened through prayer, fellowship, and engagement with the Bible. In combining these elements, the joy of spiritual unity, the importance of good order in our communal and individual lives, and the need for steadfastness in faith. Paul encapsulates a comprehensive approach to Christian living. He affirms that while believers may face deceptions and challenges, they are not alone. The spiritual bond among believers and their united strength in Christ are powerful forces. Verse 5 not only serves as a bridge from the warning against deception, but also offers a positive affirmation of the strength and resilience found in a community of believers united in Christ. It's a reminder that our journey in faith is both personal and communal, grounded in the teachings of Christ and supported by the fellowship of the church. This unity in spirit and purpose is our shield against deception and our source of joy in the Christian walk. In the light of Colossians chapter 2 verses 4 through 5, we are reminded of the dual emphasis on vigilance against deception and the strength found in our spiritual unity with Christ and fellow believers. These verses guide us in maintaining a vigilant, discerning approach towards teachings that diverge from the truth of the gospel, urging us to root our beliefs firmly in Scripture. At the same time, we are comforted and encouraged by the assurance of our spiritual bond with Christ and the Church, transcending physical barriers. 
This passage, therefore, serves as a powerful call to a disciplined, steadfast faith in Christ, harmonized with the joy and strength derived from our collective commitment to Him. It's a reminder that our faith journey is anchored not only in our personal relationship with Christ, but also in the shared experience and support within the body of Christ, empowering us to stand firm in our beliefs and live out our faith with confidence and conviction. In the heart of the Scriptures, nestled within the profound teachings of the Apostle Paul, we find a passage that encapsulates the essence of the Christian walk. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 speaks directly to the believer, offering both a reminder and a roadmap for our journey in faith. This passage, rich in metaphor and meaning, provides a clear and compelling guide for how we, as followers of Christ, are to live out our faith in a world that often seems at odds with our beliefs. At its core, this passage is about the transformative journey of faith. It begins with the life-altering decision to accept Christ Jesus as Lord, a decision that marks the start of a new life. But the journey doesn't end there. As believers, we're called to a life that is continually growing and deepening in our relationship with Christ. This passage outlines this journey in vivid detail, using powerful imagery to illustrate the depth and richness of a life lived in Christ. The message in these verses is timeless and deeply relevant. In a world where faith can sometimes feel like an afterthought or a mere aspect of our identity, Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 calls us back to the heart of what it means to be a follower of Christ. It reminds us that our faith is not just a one-time decision or a static belief system, but a dynamic, living relationship with Christ that shapes every aspect of our lives. As we delve into the depths of this passage, let us approach it with open hearts and minds, ready to be challenged and changed by the profound truth it contains. For in these verses lies a blueprint for a life of faith that is rooted, built up, and overflowing with gratitude, a life that truly reflects the Lordship of Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, we read, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. This verse, rich in meaning and guidance, is a cornerstone for our faith and daily living. The phrase, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, serves as a reminder of the fundamental truth of our faith, the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It emphasizes the personal decision to follow Christ, acknowledging His Lordship and the transformative power of His grace in our lives. This is not a mere intellectual assent, but a wholehearted embrace of Jesus, recognizing Him as the central figure in our faith and existence. The second part, so walk in Him, imparts a profound instruction on how we should live our lives. To walk in this context means to conduct one's life, to live day by day. This walking is not aimless wandering, but a purposeful journey, guided and empowered by the same faith that brought us to Christ. It suggests continuity and consistency between our initial act of faith in receiving Christ and our subsequent daily living. In essence, our lives should reflect the reality of Christ's Lordship in every aspect. This verse calls for a holistic approach to Christianity. It's not just about a moment of conversion, but an ongoing, dynamic relationship with Christ that shapes and directs every part of our existence our beliefs, values, decisions, interactions, and even our thoughts and attitudes are to be continually aligned with Christ's teachings and example. This alignment with Christ is not burdensome, but liberating. In Him, we find the true meaning, purpose, and direction for our lives. Our faith in Christ is not static, but active and alive, influencing how we live each day. We are urged to grow and mature in our faith, to deepen our understanding, and to consistently apply Christ's teachings in our daily lives. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 serves as a powerful reminder and encouragement. It calls us to remember the profound step of receiving Christ and to let that decision continually shape our daily walk. It's a call to live out our faith authentically and wholeheartedly, demonstrating the transformative power of Christ in our lives. This verse encourages us to persist in faith, to grow in our relationship with Christ and to let His Lordship be evident in every aspect of our lives. Building on the profound message of verse 6, 
the scripture continues in verse 7 with equally impactful guidance, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This verse seamlessly extends the principles laid out previously, offering further insight into our spiritual journey. The transition from verse 6 to 7 is seamless, moving from the initial act of accepting Christ and walking in Him to the deepening of that relationship. The imagery used here is rich and vivid, being rooted and built up in Him. This signifies not just a superficial connection with Christ, but a deep, enduring and growing relationship. To be rooted in Him is to draw sustenance, strength and stability from our Lord, much like a tree firmly planted and nourished by the soil. It speaks to a relationship that goes deep into the heart and soul, providing a foundation for our lives. Furthermore, being built up in Him suggests a process of growth and development. Our faith is not meant to remain static, it is to grow, develop and mature. As believers, we are like a building under construction, continuously being shaped and formed by our experiences, learning and relationship with Christ. This process of being built up is continual and dynamic, reflecting the ongoing work of Christ in our hearts and lives. The phrase, established in the faith as you have been taught, emphasizes the importance of sound teaching and doctrine in our spiritual growth. We are reminded that our faith is not based on personal feelings or contemporary trends, but grounded in the teachings of Scripture as passed down through generations. This solid foundation is crucial for a robust and resilient faith capable of withstanding the challenges and trials of life. Finally, the verse concludes with the call to be abounding in it with thanksgiving. This is a reminder that our walk in faith is not only about personal growth and stability, but also about a joyful abundance and gratitude. Our lives should overflow with thankfulness for the grace and love we have received in Christ, a gratitude that permeates every aspect of our being and is evident to those around us. Verse 7 builds upon the initial commitment to Christ, emphasizing the need for deep, sustained growth in Him. It calls us to a faith that is not only declared with our lips, but also demonstrated in our lives, a faith that is deep, stable, continuously growing and overflowing with gratitude. This verse, therefore, is not just a call to belief, but a call to a vibrant, thriving and grateful life in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 offers a compelling, holistic blueprint for the Christian life. It starts with the life-changing decision to receive Christ Jesus as Lord, a step that sets the foundation for everything that follows. But this is just the beginning. Our journey with Christ is not meant to be static, it's a dynamic, growing and flourishing walk. The scriptures clearly outline this path. First, we receive Christ and then we walk in Him our daily lives echoing our initial commitment. This walk is not a solitary or aimless journey, but one deeply rooted in Christ. Like a tree planted by streams of water, our roots go deep into the soil of God's love, drawing sustenance and strength from our relationship with Him. This rootedness provides stability and nourishment, essential for our spiritual health and growth. Moreover, we are called to be built up in Him, suggesting a continuous process of growth. As believers, we are in a constant state of construction, shaped and fortified by our experiences, learning and deepening understanding of God's Word. This growth is not aimless, but directed towards becoming more like Christ in our thoughts, words and actions. The scriptures also emphasize the importance of being established in the faith, guided by sound teaching and doctrine. Our faith is not a mere opinion or a fleeting feeling. It's grounded in the timeless truths of the Bible, taught and upheld through generations. This solid foundation helps us withstand the shifting sands of societal change and personal challenges. Lastly, our journey in Christ is marked by a spirit of thankfulness. Our lives, rooted and built up in Him, should overflow with gratitude. This thanksgiving is not just for the big milestones, but for the everyday grace that we experience in Christ. It's a gratitude that transcends circumstances, a joy that's evident to those around us. Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 is not just a passage, it's a call to a vibrant, thriving Christian life. 
It's an invitation to a journey that begins with receiving Christ and continues with growing in Him, being grounded in sound teaching and living a life marked by profound gratitude. This passage invites us to not only believe in Christ, but to let Him transform every aspect of our lives. It's a call to a faith that is alive, active, and abundant, a reminder that in Christ we have everything we need to live a life of purpose, stability, and joy. Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 presents a compact yet powerful exposition of core Christian truths addressing the nature of Christ, the dangers of worldly philosophies, and the believer's completeness in Christ. These verses are life-transforming truths that resonate with as much relevance today as they did in the first century. Before delving into this passage, it's essential to consider the context provided by the earlier parts of the letter, especially Colossians chapter 2 verse 1 through 7. Here, Paul expresses his deep care and concern for the believers, urging them to be rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith. He warns against being deceived by persuasive words and emphasizes the importance of walking in Christ, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as they were taught. This sets the stage for the critical teachings that follow in verses 8 through 10. Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10, therefore, comes as a continuation and climax of Paul's earlier exhortations. He moves from encouraging the believers in their growth and stability in Christ to explicitly warning them against the dangers of being led astray by philosophies and empty deceit according to human tradition and the basic principles of the world. This passage serves as both a warning and a profound declaration of the truth of the gospel, pointing to the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in all things. As we unpack these verses, we will explore how they speak not only to the Colossian church in a world teeming with diverse religious and philosophical influences, but also to us today, offering timeless guidance and assurance in our walk with Christ. This exploration will reveal the enduring power of Scripture to address the heart's deepest questions and life's greatest challenges, guiding us in truth and godliness. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 cautions us with these words, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. This passage is a powerful reminder to steadfastly hold on to the truth of Christ, standing firm against the ever-changing and often misleading philosophies of the world. The warning here is clear. Be vigilant. The world is filled with ideas and beliefs that can easily lead one astray, ideas rooted not in the eternal truth of the scriptures, but in human tradition and the basic principles of the world. The term philosophy here isn't a blanket condemnation of all philosophical thought, but rather a caution against philosophies that are in direct contradiction with biblical teachings. It's a call to discernment to separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to worldly wisdom. The empty deceit mentioned refers to the allure of these worldly philosophies that seem promising but ultimately lead away from Christ. The phrase, according to the tradition of men, serves as a reminder that human traditions, no matter how deeply entrenched, must never supersede the teachings of Christ. History is replete with examples of how adherence to mere human tradition can lead one away from the truth. Finally, according to the basic principles of the world, speaks to the fundamental ways of thinking and acting that are prevalent in secular society. These principles often stand in stark contrast to the teachings of Christ. As believers, we are called to live by a higher standard, one that is rooted in the wisdom and knowledge that comes from Christ alone. During Paul's time, Colossae was a melting pot of cultures and religious beliefs, including Judaism, early Christian thought, and various local and Greek philosophies. In this vibrant but spiritually chaotic setting, the church in Colossae faced challenges from teachings that sought to blend Christian beliefs with other philosophical and religious ideas. These included Gnosticism, which held that special knowledge, Gnosis, was needed for salvation, and other local traditions that mixed pagan practices with Christian teachings. Such amalgamations were attractive to many, but posed a significant threat to the purity and simplicity of the gospel message as taught by Jesus and his apostles. Paul's letter, therefore, was written to address these challenges and to reaffirm the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. 
In the specific context of Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, Paul warns against being led astray by these human traditions and philosophies which were not grounded in Christ. His caution was not against education or philosophy in itself, but against teachings that contradicted the core truths of the Christian faith. By warning the Colossians, Paul was emphasizing that Christ is the ultimate source of wisdom and knowledge, and that any teaching or tradition that detracts from his central role in salvation is misleading. The philosophy and empty deceit mentioned by Paul were teachings that relied more on human reasoning and tradition rather than on the divine revelation of Christ. In today's world, just as in the time of the Colossians, we are surrounded by a multitude of philosophies and ideas that vie for our attention and allegiance. The internet, media, and even our educational systems often propagate concepts and worldviews that are in stark contrast with biblical teachings. The challenge for believers is to navigate this flood of information without losing sight of the core truths of our faith. The warning to beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit is a call to vigilance. It reminds us to critically evaluate the ideas and beliefs we encounter daily, measuring them against the truth of the scriptures. In an age where relativism and the idea that truth is subjective are rampant, this verse encourages us to hold firmly to the objective truth as revealed in the Bible. The reference to the tradition of men and the basic principles of the world speaks directly to the societal norms and popular opinions that often contradict biblical values. As believers, we are reminded that our standard for living and our understanding of truth should not be dictated by societal trends or popular opinion, but by the teachings of Christ. Moreover, this scripture urges us not to be swayed by the allure of empty deceit, ideas that may seem appealing and sophisticated, yet are devoid of any spiritual truth or value. In an era where there is a temptation to blend Christian beliefs with secular ideologies, this verse serves as a stark reminder of the importance of maintaining the purity of the gospel message. Verse 8 is a timeless exhortation for believers to remain grounded in the teachings of Christ amidst a world of conflicting and often misleading philosophies. It calls for discernment, a deepening of our understanding of the scriptures, and a commitment to live out our faith authentically according to the unchanging principles found in God's Word. It's a reminder that our faith is not just a personal belief system, but a comprehensive worldview that stands in contrast to the fleeting and often misguided wisdom of the world. As modern-day believers, embracing and applying this truth is crucial in our walk with Christ, enabling us to be lights in a world that desperately needs the unchanging truth of the gospel. Paul's warning in verse 8 sets the stage for the profound declaration in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, which reads, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This verse serves as a powerful affirmation of the deity and supremacy of Christ, directly connecting to the previous warning by establishing the foundation upon which our faith must rest. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 is a pivotal scripture that declares the fullness of deity resides in Jesus Christ. The phrase, for in him, unmistakably refers to Christ. What follows is a monumental truth about his nature, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This statement asserts that in Jesus Christ, the entire nature and essence of God is present in a physical form. It is a direct and unequivocal affirmation of the belief in the deity of Christ, indicating that Jesus is not just a reflection of God or a part of God, but is fully God himself. This verse is crucial because it lays the foundation for understanding the true nature of Christ, countering any teachings that might diminish his divine status. It asserts that Jesus Christ is not merely a prophet or a revered teacher, but God in the flesh. This understanding is vital to our faith, particularly in light of the previous verse's warning against deceptive philosophies. If Christ were not fully divine, his sacrifice on the cross would not have the infinite value necessary to atone for the sins of humanity. Moreover, the use of the term Godhead in this context is significant. It refers to the divine essence or nature, emphasizing the completeness and perfection of God's nature in Christ. This part of the verse confronts and counters any ideas that might perceive Jesus as a lesser or subordinate deity. The concluding word bodily reaffirms the incarnation, the truth that God took on human form. 
This highlights the reality of Jesus' humanity and his physical presence on earth. It assures us that God, in his full nature, chose to become accessible and relatable to us in human form. Paul's declaration here in verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, was a direct response to the challenges facing the Colossian church. The believers in Colossae were being exposed to teachings that questioned or undermined the complete divinity and humanity of Jesus Christ. Some of these teachings suggested that Jesus was less than fully divine or that he was a spiritual being without a true physical body. Such ideas were not only incorrect but were dangerously misleading as they distorted the true nature and work of Christ. Paul's statement was a bold and clear affirmation of the orthodox Christian belief in the deity of Christ. By asserting that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus bodily, Paul was emphasizing that Jesus was not a mere emanation of God or a created being with a lesser divine status. Instead, he was fully and completely God in human form. This was a crucial point, for the work of salvation depends on Jesus being fully God, able to bridge the gap between God and humanity, and fully man, able to represent humanity before God. Additionally, this verse served to counter Gnostic tendencies that were emerging at the time. Gnosticism, which fully developed later, often involved a dualistic view of spirit and matter, typically treating matter as evil and spirit as good. In such a view, the idea of God taking on a physical body would be unthinkable. Paul's assertion that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ bodily was a direct challenge to such dualism, affirming the goodness of creation and the reality of the Incarnation. In a world brimming with diverse ideologies and spiritualities, this verse anchors us in the essential truth about Jesus Christ, affirming his unique and complete divinity and humanity. In today's context where the identity and nature of Jesus are often distorted or misunderstood, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 serves as a clear and unwavering declaration of who Christ is. It asserts that in Jesus, the full nature and essence of God are present in a physical form. This truth is foundational to our faith, for it affirms that Jesus Christ is not a mere spiritual guide or moral teacher, but God himself in human form. This understanding is critical in a society that often promotes a view of Jesus that aligns with personal preferences or cultural trends rather than the truth presented in Scripture. The relevance of this verse extends beyond mere doctrinal affirmation. It has practical implications for how we live out our faith. Understanding that Jesus is fully God means that his teachings, actions and promises carry the full weight of divine authority. It assures us that when we encounter Jesus in the Gospels, we are encountering God himself. This knowledge should deepen our reverence for Scripture, strengthen our commitment to living according to its teachings, and increase our confidence in the promises of God. Furthermore, the truth that the fullness of God dwelt in Christ bodily affirms the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation, which is essential for understanding the work of salvation. It means that Jesus, being fully human, could represent humanity, bearing our sins and suffering the consequences of those sins on the cross. Simultaneously, being fully divine, his sacrifice has infinite worth, sufficient to atone for the sins of the entire world. In a world that often promotes a fragmented view of spirituality, where the physical and spiritual are seen as disconnected, this verse reminds us of the integration of the physical and spiritual in God's plan. The Incarnation, God becoming man, demonstrates the value and goodness of the physical world, which God himself entered and redeemed. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 is not just a theological statement, it is the bedrock of our faith. It affirms the identity of Christ as fully God and fully man. This truth is integral to understanding the significance of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It assures us of the sufficiency and completeness of Christ's work for our salvation. In Him, we find the full expression of God's love, wisdom, and truth, countering any hollow and deceptive philosophy as warned in verse 8. This powerful verse anchors our faith and belief in the absolute supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. Following the profound declaration of Christ's divine nature in verse 9, the Apostle Paul transitions seamlessly into the next verse, Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, which says, And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. 
This verse is not only a natural extension of the previous verse, but also a powerful statement about our identity and position in Christ. In verse 9, we learn that, In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This establishes Jesus Christ as fully God and fully man, the central figure of our faith. Verse 10 builds on this by explaining the implications of this truth for believers, and you are complete in Him. This phrase holds profound meaning for our spiritual lives. To be complete in Him means that in Christ we find everything necessary for our spiritual wholeness and maturity. There is nothing lacking in our relationship with God when we are in Christ. Our redemption, righteousness, and sanctification are all found in Him. This counters any teaching that suggests we need additional spiritual experiences, secret knowledge, or adherence to human traditions to be fully mature in our faith. Furthermore, the verse acknowledges Christ's authority, who is the head of all principality and power. This not only refers to his sovereignty over earthly realms, but also over all spiritual powers. In a world where many feel overwhelmed by spiritual and earthly forces, this is a reassuring reminder of Christ's supreme authority. As believers, our union with Christ means we are connected to the one who has ultimate authority over every power, whether physical or spiritual. The transition from affirming Christ's full deity in the previous verse to declaring our completeness in Him in this verse is significant. It bridges the gap between theological truth and practical application. It tells us that the fullness of God present in Christ is not just a doctrinal point to be acknowledged, but it has real, tangible implications for our lives. In Christ we have been made complete, lacking nothing in terms of our spiritual needs and standing before God. This completeness is not because of our own efforts or achievements, but because we are in Him who is above all. The believers in Colossae were facing a unique set of challenges. They encountered various teachings that sought to add to or take away from the simple truth of the gospel. These included early forms of Gnosticism, which proposed that special knowledge was necessary for salvation and Judaic legalism, which emphasized adherence to the law. Additionally, there were local pagan beliefs and practices that could easily confuse and lead astray the young Christian community. Paul's declaration in verse 10 was not just doctrinal. It was immensely practical and reassuring for the believers. By stating that they were complete in him, Paul addressed the temptation the Colossians might have felt to seek spiritual fulfillment in these other philosophies and religious practices. It was a direct counter to the notion that something more than Christ was needed for spiritual completeness, whether that be additional rituals, deeper secret knowledge, or adherence to traditional laws. The affirmation that Christ is the head of all principality and power was a powerful reminder of his sovereignty over all other spiritual and earthly authorities. This would have been particularly impactful in a context where various spiritual powers and authorities were venerated. It placed Christ above all these powers, affirming his supremacy not just in the church, but in the entire universe. In our modern era, characterized by a vast array of ideologies, spiritualities, and a relentless pursuit of self-improvement, this verse speaks a timeless truth into our lives. In Christ, we are complete. This assertion confronts the pervasive notion in contemporary society that we need something more to be fulfilled, be it success, material possessions, spiritual experiences, or self-help philosophies. The message of this scripture is clear. Our completeness, our fulfillment, and our spiritual wholeness are found not in these things, but in Christ alone. This is a radical, countercultural claim that challenges the very core of modern consumerism and individualism, which often leaves people feeling perpetually incomplete and searching for the next thing that will satisfy. The phrase, who is the head of all principality and power, serves as a powerful reminder of Christ's sovereignty and authority over every aspect of life. In an age where many feel overwhelmed by political upheaval, social injustices, and personal struggles, this verse reassures us that Christ reigns supreme over all powers, both earthly and spiritual. This truth should embolden our faith, knowing that the one we follow is above all rulers, authorities, and human philosophies. For believers today, living in a world that constantly suggests we need more to be complete, Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 offers a profound counter-narrative. It encourages us to find our identity, purpose, and satisfaction in our relationship with Christ, 
rather than in the endless pursuit of worldly achievements or spiritual novelties. It calls us to a life of contentment and confidence in Him, resting in the knowledge that we are fully complete in Christ and under His sovereign rule. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 is a verse of immense encouragement and assurance. It invites us to live in the reality of our completeness in Christ, rooted in the knowledge of His supremacy and authority. This understanding should shape our approach to spiritual growth, our response to challenges, and our perspective on the spiritual forces at work in the world. It's a call to rest in the sufficiency of Christ, to live confidently in the knowledge that we are complete in Him, and to stand firm in the face of any teaching or influence that suggests otherwise. This truth is liberating, empowering, and transforming for believers, guiding us to live out our faith with confidence and assurance. Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 stands as a beacon of truth and assurance for every believer. These verses collectively offer a comprehensive understanding of the Christian faith and our position in Christ. Verse 8 warns us against the allure of worldly philosophies and human traditions, which can lead us away from the truth of Christ. This verse is a call to discernment, urging us to anchor our beliefs and lives firmly in the teachings of the scriptures rather than in the shifting sands of human wisdom and tradition. In verse 9, we are presented with the majestic truth of Christ's deity, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This affirmation of Jesus Christ as fully God and fully man is central to our faith. It underscores the sufficiency of Christ's work on the cross for our salvation and his authority over all creation. It reminds us that in Jesus we encounter the living God who bridges the gap between divinity and humanity. Verse 10 brings this profound truth home to each of us personally. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In Christ, we find our completeness, lacking nothing for our spiritual life and godliness. This verse reassures us that in our union with Christ, we are connected to the one who has ultimate authority over every realm. It challenges the modern narrative of perpetual striving for more, inviting us to rest in the all-sufficiency of Christ. Together, these verses weave a compelling narrative of theological truth and practical application. They call us to a steadfast faith, rooted not in the changing ideologies of our time, but in the unchanging truth of the gospel. They invite us to live confidently, knowing that in Christ we have all we need for life and godliness, and they encourage us to stand firm in our faith, anchored in the supremacy of Christ over every power and principality. As believers, embracing and living out the truths in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8-10 through 10, is crucial. They guide us to resist the lure of worldly philosophies, to rejoice in the full deity and humanity of Christ, and to rest in our completeness in Him. In a world of uncertainties and shifting shadows, these verses shine brightly, pointing us to the unshakable truth and sufficiency of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. As we delve into the heart of Colossians, Chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, we are entering a passage rich with the depth of spiritual truth, a passage that speaks directly to the transformative power of faith in Christ. This segment of Scripture builds upon the foundational teachings presented in the earlier verses of Colossians 2, where we were cautioned against being swayed by deceptive philosophies and encouraged to root ourselves in Christ, in whom the fullness of deity dwells bodily. In these pivotal verses, the Apostle Paul, writing to the believers in Colossae, provides a profound explanation of what it means to be in Christ. The passage navigates through the spiritual realities that define a believer's existence, from the cutting away of the old sinful nature to the victorious triumph over spiritual principalities. It is a passage that reinforces the complete sufficiency of Christ and the fullness that believers have in Him. As we explore these verses, we uncover the layers of meaning behind spiritual circumcision and baptism, both significant markers in a believer's journey. These are not mere religious rites, but deeply symbolic acts that reflect our inner transformation. Furthermore, we are reminded of the absolute forgiveness we have in Christ, a freedom from the shackles of our past, sins and failures. Moving deeper, we encounter the triumphant victory of Christ over spiritual forces. This is a victory that is not distant or abstract, but one that has direct implications for our daily lives as believers. 
It's a victory that grants us freedom, authority, and a new identity in Christ. As we journey through this passage, let us do so with open hearts and minds, ready to embrace the profound implications of these truths in our lives. These verses are not just a segment of an ancient letter. They are living words that continue to resonate with power and relevance for us today. They offer us a clear vision of our identity in Christ, a blueprint for our spiritual journey, and a source of unending hope and assurance in the transformative work of Christ in our lives. In understanding the profound message of Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, it is essential to first grasp the context presented in the preceding verses, verses 8 through 10. These verses caution against being led astray by worldly philosophies and traditions that are not based on Christ. It emphasizes the fullness of deity that dwells in Christ and how believers are made complete in Him who is the head over every power and authority. In verse 11, we read, In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. This verse is a powerful reminder of the spiritual transformation that takes place in a believer's life. The traditional Jewish practice of circumcision is used here as a metaphor. Just as circumcision was a sign of being set apart in the Old Testament, this verse speaks of a circumcision made without hands, a spiritual transformation that cuts away the sinful nature. It's not a physical act, but a spiritual one, achieved through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. This spiritual circumcision is the putting off or stripping away of our sinful nature represented by the body of the sins of the flesh. It signifies a profound inner change, a complete break from the old way of life dominated by sin and a new creation in Christ. This verse, therefore, connects seamlessly with the previous verses. After warning against hollow and deceptive philosophies, it affirms the completeness found in Christ. It declares that in Christ, Believers have experienced a profound spiritual change that goes beyond external rituals or adherence to rules. This change is internal, a heart transformation that aligns believers with Christ's righteousness. Verse 11 offers a vivid illustration of the spiritual reality for every believer, a transformation that marks a break from the past, a renewal in Christ, freeing them from the power of sin and aligning them with the righteousness of Christ. It's a call to recognize and live out this new identity, fully embraced and empowered by the indwelling presence of Christ. Building upon the spiritual truths revealed in verse 11, we seamlessly transition into verse 12, which further reveals the transformative experience of a believer. Verse 12 reads, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. This verse deepens our understanding of the spiritual journey that begins with the circumcision made without hands mentioned in the previous verse. It uses the powerful symbolism of baptism to illustrate the believer's union with Christ in both his death and resurrection. The act of being buried with him in baptism signifies our identification with Christ's death. It represents the believer's death to the old way of life, a complete submersion into the reality of Christ's sacrifice. However, this verse doesn't stop at the death. It triumphantly proclaims our participation in Christ's resurrection. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of God, believers too are raised with Him. This resurrection is not a physical one, but a spiritual awakening brought about through faith in God's mighty work. It's a call to a new life, a life of righteousness and holiness, empowered by the same force that raised Christ from the dead. This connection between baptism and our spiritual journey is vital. Baptism is not merely a ritual or a symbolic act. It is a declaration of faith, a powerful testimony to the work of God in a believer's life. In baptism, we are not only imitating Christ's burial and resurrection, we are participating in it. Our faith in the working of God who raised Christ and by extension raises us is the cornerstone of this spiritual journey. Verse 12 offers a vivid picture of the Christian life. It is a life marked by death to sin and a new birth into a living hope through Christ Jesus. As we reflect on this, it is an invitation to live in the reality of this new life, constantly renewed by faith in the power of God who has made us alive together with Christ. 
It's a reminder that our faith is not grounded in human traditions or philosophies, but in the transformative power of God through Christ. Continuing our journey through the profound truths in Colossians, we come to verse 13, which deepens our understanding of the transformation in Christ. Verse 13 states, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. This verse speaks directly to the heart of our spiritual condition before Christ. It starts by acknowledging a stark reality, that we were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. This phrase paints a vivid picture of our state apart from Christ, spiritually dead, lost in our sins, and separated from the life of God due to our innate sinful nature. However, the verse pivots dramatically with the words, He has made alive together with Him. This is the crux of the gospel message. Despite our spiritual deadness and separation from God, He, in His boundless mercy and grace, has made us alive with Christ. This spiritual resurrection is not a result of our own doing or merit. It is purely the work of divine grace. Furthermore, the verse emphasizes the totality of God's forgiveness, having forgiven you all trespasses. It's not a partial forgiveness or a conditional one. It's complete and encompassing. Every transgression, every sin, every failing is covered by the grace of God through Christ's sacrifice. This forgiveness is not just a theological concept. It's a reality that transforms our lives. Verse 13 encapsulates the essence of the Christian faith. Our condition without Christ, the transformative work of God in making us alive with Christ, and the comprehensive forgiveness of our sins. It's a reminder that our new life in Christ isn't just an improvement of the old life, it's a complete resurrection from death to life. It invites us to embrace this new life fully, to live in the reality of God's grace, and to walk in the freedom that comes from being forgiven and made alive in Christ. Moving forward from the uplifting message of verse 13, which speaks of our spiritual revival and forgiveness in Christ, we arrive at verse 14. This verse further illuminates the magnificent work of Christ on our behalf. Verse 14 states, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This verse is a profound declaration of the freedom we have in Christ. The handwriting of requirements refers to the law with its commandments and ordinances. The law exposed our sin and our inability to fulfill God's perfect standards. It stood as a testimony against us, a reminder of our shortcomings and failures. However, the power of this verse lies in what Christ has done with this handwriting. He didn't just cover it or set it aside, he wiped it out. This act signifies the complete removal of the legal charges against us. By his death on the cross, Christ dealt with our sins decisively and completely. He took the record of our transgressions and effectively obliterated it, liberating us from the guilt and penalty of sin. Paul tells us that he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The imagery here is powerful. By nailing our sins to the cross, Christ removed the barrier that separated us from God. The cross stands as the definitive solution to our greatest problem, sin and separation from God. It is the ultimate demonstration of God's love and justice meeting together. Verse 14 offers a picture of the complete and total victory we have in Christ. It reassures us that our sins are not just forgiven, but are completely wiped out. This truth is not only a source of deep comfort, but also a call to live in the freedom and victory Christ has secured for us. It's an invitation to lay aside the guilt and condemnation of the past and to embrace the new life of freedom and grace in Christ. Following the profound truths in verse 14 about the cancellation of our sins through Christ's sacrifice, we transition to the triumphant victory proclaimed in verse 15. Verse 15 declares, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This verse carries us into the realm of Christ's victory over spiritual forces. The principalities and powers refer to spiritual authorities and powers, which in many ways held humanity captive through sin and death. Before Christ, these spiritual forces had a certain dominion due to the power of sin and the law. However, through his death on the cross, Christ disarmed these powers. The imagery is that of a victorious king who strips his enemies of their weapons, rendering them powerless. This act of disarming is significant. 
It means that whatever power these spiritual forces had over us, be it through sin, accusation, or death, has been nullified. They can no longer claim dominion over us because Christ has decisively defeated them. Christ didn't just defeat these powers quietly or privately. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The cross, which seemed like a moment of defeat, was actually Christ's triumph. In the ancient world, a victorious general would parade his defeated enemies through the streets, showcasing his victory. Similarly, Christ's victory over these powers was made public, showcased on the cross for all to see. This victory has profound implications for us. It means that we are no longer under the tyranny of these spiritual forces. We are freed from the grip of sin and death. The fear, guilt, and shame that once held us captive have been defeated. We now live in the light of Christ's victory, a victory that he shares with us. Verse 15 is a powerful affirmation of the total victory we have in Christ. It's a call to live confidently, knowing that Christ has triumphed over all the powers that once opposed us. It's an invitation to embrace the freedom and authority we have in him, standing firm in the victory that Christ has won for us. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 15, we find a message of profound hope, an unshakable victory in Christ. These verses paint a vivid picture of the spiritual transformation that occurs when one places their faith in Christ, highlighting the profound shift from death to life, from bondage to freedom. Beginning with the spiritual circumcision in Christ, we are reminded that our old sinful nature has been cut away, not by human hands, but by the divine work of Christ on the cross. This is not just a symbolic act, but a reality that signifies a complete transformation of our very being. Then, as we looked at baptism, we saw it as a powerful testament to our union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Baptism symbolizes our death to sin and our new life in Christ, a life no longer enslaved to the old ways, but empowered by the Spirit of God. The journey continued with the assurance of our forgiveness, where every sin, every trespass has been wiped away. This is not just a partial eradication, but a complete obliteration of our sins, fully accomplished by Christ's atoning sacrifice. And finally, we celebrated in the triumphant victory of Christ over principalities and powers. Christ disarmed the spiritual forces of evil, making a public spectacle of them and triumphing over them on the cross. This victory is not just Christ's, it is ours as well. In him, we share in this triumph, freed from the clutches of spiritual darkness. These verses taken together offer a powerful and life-changing message. They remind us that in Christ, we are new creations. Our past does not define us. Our sins do not enslave us. We are not under the dominion of spiritual forces of darkness, but are living in the light and freedom of Christ's victory. Therefore, as believers, let us embrace this truth with confidence. Let us live out our new identity in Christ, standing firm in the freedom he has won for us. Let us walk in the assurance of our forgiveness and the certainty of our victory in Christ. This is not just a theological concept to be pondered, but a living reality to be experienced and manifested in our daily lives. In Christ, we are truly free, truly alive, and truly victorious. In approaching Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, we find ourselves delving into a passage rich with instruction and wisdom, one that speaks directly to the heart of our faith and practice. This section of Paul's letter to the Colossians is an extension of his earlier teachings in the same chapter, where he emphasizes the preeminence and sufficiency of Christ in all things, a theme that is central to the entire letter. The earlier part of Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 15 sets the stage for this discussion. Paul reminds us of the richness of being in Christ, warning against being led astray by deceptive philosophies and human traditions that are not rooted in Christ. He speaks of the fullness found in Christ and the freedom we have through his death and resurrection. He assures us that in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and we are complete in him, who is the head over all principality and power. Building on this foundation, Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 through 23 addresses specific practices and beliefs that were causing division and confusion among the believers in Colossae. This passage is a potent reminder that our relationship with God is not contingent upon adhering to a set of religious rules or ascetic practices. Instead, 
It is rooted in the transformative work of Christ, who has triumphed over all principalities and powers, setting us free from the bondage of legalistic and human traditions. Paul's words are as relevant today as they were to the first century church. In a world where we are often tempted to judge our spiritual life by external standards or to add human traditions to the simplicity of faith in Christ, this passage calls us back to the heart of the gospel. It challenges us to examine our own beliefs and practices, urging us to embrace the freedom and fullness that are ours in Christ Jesus. As we explore Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, we are invited to deepen our understanding of what it means to live in the freedom of Christ, free from the constraints of human regulations, and focused on the substance of our faith, Christ himself. This exploration is a journey into the heart of what it means to be followers of Christ, living in the grace and truth he has so richly bestowed upon us. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, we find a declaration of Christ's triumph. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This verse vividly depicts the victory of Christ over all forces of darkness. It's a portrayal of his authority and the completion of his redemptive work on the cross. Christ in his crucifixion and resurrection didn't just overcome. He publicly displayed his victory, shaming the spiritual rulers and authorities. Moving into verse 16, we read, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. This verse is a natural progression from the victory spoken of in verse 15. It's an exhortation to believers, reminding them of the freedom they have in Christ. The context here is crucial. The early church, emerging in a diverse cultural landscape, grappled with integrating believers from various backgrounds, particularly Jewish and Gentile converts. This integration brought up questions about dietary laws, religious festivals, and other practices that were integral to Jewish law and tradition. Paul's words in verse 16 are an encouragement to believers not to be bound by the judgment of others regarding these external religious practices. The essence here is that Christ's triumph over the spiritual realm has freed believers from the legalistic adherence to rituals and ceremonies that were part of the Old Covenant. It's a powerful reminder that in Christ, there is freedom from the judgments and regulations that can divide and burden. This passage resonates with the heart of Christian faith, the centrality and sufficiency of Christ. It teaches us that our standing before God is not based on external religious observances, but on the finished work of Christ. It's a call to focus on the spiritual reality of our relationship with God, rather than getting entangled in religious rites and rituals that can often lead to divisions and a sense of spiritual superiority. Verse 16, following the triumphant note of verse 15, asserts the freedom believers have in Christ from religious regulations and judgments. It's a powerful statement about the essence of Christian faith, which rests not on human traditions, but on the transformative work of Jesus Christ. As followers of Christ, we are encouraged to live in this freedom, focusing on what truly matters, our relationship with God through Christ. In verse 16, as we've seen, Paul encourages believers not to let anyone judge them over matters like food, drink, or religious festivals. This verse is a bold declaration of the freedom that comes from being in Christ, a freedom from the judgment and regulations tied to religious practices. Then we come to Colossians verse 17, which says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. This verse beautifully complements and extends the thought of the previous verse. Here, Paul is explaining that the dietary laws, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths were mere shadows of what was to be revealed in Christ. They were not the reality themselves, but pointed towards the coming Messiah and his kingdom. The imagery of a shadow is powerful. A shadow indicates the presence of something real and substantive, yet it is not the substance itself. In the same way, the religious practices of the Old Testament, while important and ordained by God, were not the ultimate goal. They were intended to prepare the people and point them towards Christ, the Messiah. In Christ, the substance has come. The laws and rituals were a guide, a tutor, to lead us to Him. Now that He has come, we are no longer bound to those shadows. This does not mean that the law was unimportant. Rather, it served its purpose in God's grand plan of redemption. Now that Christ has come, we are to focus on Him, the substance of our faith. 
This passage is a reminder to not get entangled in debates and judgments over religious practices that are no longer central to our faith. The focus is not on the rituals themselves, but on what they pointed to, the redemptive work of Christ. In Him, we find the fulfillment of all the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. Verse 17 serves as a profound reminder that Christ is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament's sacrificial system and ceremonial laws represented. In Him, we find the fullness and completion of God's plan for salvation. As believers, our focus should be on Christ, the substance, rather than the shadows of religious practices. This understanding elevates our faith from mere ritual observance to a vibrant, living relationship with Jesus Christ. Moving into verse 18, we read, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. This verse addresses a specific challenge faced by the Colossian church, the danger of being led astray by false teachings and practices that deviated from the truth of the gospel. Paul warns the believers not to be cheated out of their reward. This cheating refers to being misled or deprived of the truth and fullness of the Christian faith. The practices he mentions, such as false humility and angel worship, represent departures from the centrality of Christ in Christian faith and practice. False humility, as mentioned in this verse, could be understood as an insincere, self-imposed piety that does not stem from a genuine relationship with God. It's a kind of humility that's not rooted in the acknowledgement of Christ's lordship, but in human effort and religious pride. The worship of angels, another practice Paul warns against, was likely a form of early Gnosticism infiltrating the church. Gnosticism was a heretical belief system that incorporated elements of mysticism and a distorted view of spiritual realms. By engaging in the worship of angels, believers were being distracted from the centrality of Christ and were instead delving into speculative, non-biblical ideas about spiritual beings. The phrase, intruding into those things which he has not seen, further critiques those who claim to have special, mystical insight into the spiritual realm. Such claims, Paul asserts, are baseless and a product of a fleshly, unspiritual mind. These teachings were not grounded in the truth of the gospel, but were speculative and misleading. Verse 18 serves as a strong warning against being led astray by teachings and practices that divert from the core message of the gospel. It reminds believers to remain anchored in Christ, the true substance of their faith, and to be wary of teachings that promote a spirituality based on human ideas rather than the truth revealed in Christ. It's a call to hold fast to the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, rejecting any practice or belief that undermines His sufficiency and supremacy. Building on the themes presented in verse 18, we find verse 19 providing further insight into the importance of staying true to the core of our faith. Verse 19 says, And not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. This verse is a compelling continuation of the thought in the previous verse and speaks to the consequences of deviating from the true doctrine. Here Paul uses the metaphor of the body to describe the church. Christ is referred to as the head of this body. This metaphor beautifully illustrates the relationship between Christ and the church. Just as the head in a human body is the control center for growth, movement, and coordination, so is Christ in relation to the church. The health and growth of the church depend on its connection to Christ. The phrase, not holding fast to the head, serves as a warning. It implies that if believers are swayed by false teachings, like those mentioned in the previous verse, they are essentially not maintaining their connection with Christ, the head of the church. The implication is profound. Disconnection from Christ results in a lack of spiritual nourishment and growth. The terms nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments further develop this metaphor. In a physical body, joints and ligaments are what hold the different parts together, allowing them to function in harmony. In the spiritual body of the church, these joints and ligaments can be seen as the relationships, teachings and practices that keep the church unified and growing. When these are healthy and Christ-centered, the church grows with the increase that is from God. 
This growth is not just numerical, but spiritual. It's the kind of growth that comes from God, rooted in the truth of His Word and the life-giving connection to Christ. It reflects a deepening of faith, a strengthening of community, and a maturing in understanding and living out the gospel. Verse 19 serves as a powerful reminder to stay firmly anchored in Christ. In a world full of diverse and often misleading teachings, the call is to remain steadfast in our connection with Christ, deriving our spiritual nourishment and guidance from Him. It emphasizes the importance of doctrinal integrity and spiritual unity, which are essential for the health and growth of the Church. As believers, our focus should be on deepening our relationship with Christ, ensuring that our practices, teachings, and community life are all centered on Him, the true Head of the Church. Moving from verse 19 into verse 20, we transition from a focus on the importance of staying connected to Christ, the Head of the Church, to a consideration of the implications of our union with Christ, particularly in relation to worldly principles. Verse 20 states, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? This verse is a powerful continuation of the themes Paul has been discussing. In verse 19, Paul emphasizes the necessity of holding fast to Christ for nourishment and growth. Now, in verse 20, he reminds believers of a fundamental truth of the Christian faith. Through faith in Christ, we have died to the basic principles of the world. This dying is a spiritual union with Christ in his death, symbolizing a break from the bondage of worldly systems and values. The basic principles of the world refer to the elementary spiritual forces and human-made systems that are apart from Christ. These can include legalistic religious practices, worldly philosophies, and human traditions that are not in line with the gospel. Paul's question is rhetorical and poignant. He asks why believers who have died with Christ to these worldly principles would continue to live as if they are still bound by them. This verse is a call to Christian liberty. It encourages believers to live in the freedom that comes from being united with Christ in His death and resurrection. This freedom is not a license to sin, but a release from being governed by rules and regulations that have no power to truly change the heart or bring one closer to God. The verse also serves as a caution against legalism. Legalism is the practice of focusing on laws or rules to the extent that it overshadows the core message of the gospel grace and redemption through Christ. Paul is urging the Colossian believers not to be ensnared again by a yoke of slavery to religious rules that Christ has freed them from. Verse 20 calls us to live out the reality of our new identity in Christ. As those who have died with Christ, we are no longer bound by the world's fundamental principles, but are free to live a life that is guided by the Spirit, rooted in grace, and focused on the redemptive work of Christ. It's a reminder that our life in Christ is characterized by freedom from the empty and binding traditions of human origin and is anchored in the transformative power of the gospel. Continuing our exploration of Colossians, we now arrive at verse 21, which follows seamlessly from the theme established in verse 20. Verse 21 states, Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. This verse directly quotes the kind of prohibitions that some in the Colossian church were likely advocating. These commands represent a form of legalism, a reliance on human rules and regulations as a means to achieve holiness. The progression from verse 20 to verse 21 is clear. Having established that believers have died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, Paul now illustrates what those worldly principles look like in practice. The commands, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, are examples of the type of rules that some were imposing, claiming that adherence to them was necessary for spiritual purity and favor with God. This verse exposes the futility and superficiality of legalism. These regulations focus on external conduct and physical things, suggesting that avoiding certain foods or physical contacts could somehow contribute to one's spiritual standing. This approach is starkly contrasted with the gospel message, which teaches that salvation and sanctification are the work of Christ and not the result of human effort or adherence to rules. Paul's point is not that all rules or disciplines are bad. Instead, he is emphasizing that when rules become the basis of our relationship with God, replacing the grace and freedom found in Christ, they are misguided and harmful. 
Such rules do not have the power to truly change the heart or bring one closer to God. They can create a false sense of piety and superiority, leading to judgment and division among believers. Verse 21 is a poignant reminder of the danger of legalism. It urges believers to recognize that true holiness and righteousness come not through external observances, but through a heart transformed by Christ's work on the cross. It's an invitation to embrace the freedom we have in Christ, a freedom not to indulge the flesh, but to live in a way that honors God, guided by His Spirit and rooted in His grace. This freedom liberates us from the empty and burdensome dictates of human regulations and leads us into a deeper, more authentic relationship with God. As we continue to unpack the message in Colossians, we move from verse 21 to verse 22. Verse 22 reads, Which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. This verse provides further insight into the nature of the regulations mentioned in verse 21. Paul is pointing out that the rules he just referenced are about things that are temporal and perishable. The dietary laws and other ritualistic practices under discussion involve material things that, by their very nature, are transient. By focusing on such temporary earthly things, believers can miss the greater eternal realities found in Christ. The phrase, according to the commandments and doctrines of men, is particularly striking. It underscores that these regulations are human inventions, not divine commands. They are based on human traditions and teachings, not on the gospel of Christ. This distinction is crucial because it highlights the contrast between human-made religious rules and the liberating truth of the gospel. The passage is a critique of the way human traditions can sometimes be elevated to a status they do not deserve, becoming almost equivalent to divine law in the eyes of some. This elevation not only misrepresents the nature of these practices, but also can lead to a form of worship that is more about ritual and rule-keeping than about a heartfelt relationship with God through Christ. Paul's message in this verse is a call to focus on what is eternal and God-given. It is a reminder that while certain practices and disciplines can be helpful in our spiritual walk, they should never replace or overshadow the core of our faith, the redemptive work of Christ and our relationship with Him. This is not a license for lawlessness or moral laxity, but a call to recognize that true righteousness and holiness come from a life transformed by Christ, not from rigid adherence to human traditions. Verse 22 challenges us to discern between human traditions and God's commands, encouraging us to prioritize our spiritual union with Christ over adherence to rules that are ultimately transient and not essential for our salvation. It is an encouragement to live in the freedom and fullness that comes from a life rooted in Christ, not in the perishable elements of the world. As we delve further into Colossians, moving from verse 22 to verse 23, we continue to explore Paul's teachings on the relationship between Christian faith and human traditions. Verse 23 says, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. This verse is critical in understanding the ineffectiveness of legalistic practices in promoting genuine spiritual growth. The these things Paul refers to are the religious rules and ascetic practices he previously mentioned. He acknowledges that these practices might seem wise. They can give an outward impression of piety and discipline. They involve a self-imposed form of worship and often include an element of false humility. Additionally, these practices may involve harsh treatment of the body, like severe fasting or abstaining from certain comforts or pleasures, in an attempt to gain spiritual merit. However, Paul is clear in his assertion, despite their appearance of wisdom, these practices are ineffective in combating the true issues of sin and the indulgence of the flesh. The critical point here is that while these practices may look spiritually admirable on the surface, they do not address the deeper issues of the human heart. They do not have the power to transform the inner person or to conquer sinful desires and inclinations. This verse challenges the notion that external religious practices by themselves can produce true holiness or spiritual growth. It's an argument against a superficial form of religiosity that emphasizes outward appearances over inner transformation. The kind of change that the gospel calls for involves a deep, heart-level transformation that can only be brought about by the Spirit of God working within us, not by our external efforts or self-denial. 
Paul's teaching in verse 23 encourages believers to look beyond the surface and understand that true spiritual growth and victory over sin come from a vibrant, living relationship with Christ. It's a reminder that our focus should be on nurturing our relationship with Him, allowing His Spirit to transform us from the inside out. This inward transformation is what leads to genuine godliness as opposed to a religion that is merely about following rules and appearing pious. Verse 23 calls us to recognize the limitations of self-imposed religion and ascetic practices. It urges us to seek the kind of spiritual transformation that comes from a deep, personal relationship with Christ, rather than relying on external observances that might appear wise but are ineffective in truly changing our hearts and lives. In summarizing our journey through Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, it's clear that Paul's message to the church in Colossae, and by extension to us, is deeply relevant and profoundly impactful. These verses challenge us to re-evaluate the basis of our faith and the practices we adhere to in our spiritual walk. This passage is a powerful reminder of the freedom we have in Christ. It calls us to live a life that is rooted in the reality of Christ's finished work on the cross, not in the shadows of human traditions. Our faith should be anchored in a personal and transformative relationship with Jesus, not in ritualistic or ascetic practices that can lead to a false sense of piety and spiritual growth. Paul's message in Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 through 23 encourages us to focus on the spiritual realities that are in Christ. It teaches us to seek after genuine heart transformation which comes only through a relationship with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. This teaching challenges us to examine our own practices and beliefs, encouraging us to shed anything that does not lead us closer to Christ and the truth of the gospel. These verses from Colossians call us to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the freedom and fullness we have in Christ. They invite us to live out our faith authentically and sincerely, focusing on internal transformation rather than external appearances. In Christ, we are called to a life of freedom and growth, a life that is deeply rooted in the truth of His Word and the power of His Spirit.